Hi, just a quick follow-up video on this classic Hewlett Packard 35660A dynamic signal analyzer or FFT analyzer as they're known in the trade. And if you haven't watched the previous uh, repair video of this, um, it'll be linked in down below. So please watch that first. Now, uh, one other thing that was noted in the previous video is we've got rounding on the CRT display here. Look at these dark round patches on there like that and uh, anyone in the uh, photography or video industry will know that as a vig netting uh, effect around the outside now um, what is causing this now I you know there were quite a few people who said oh there's a you know a circular mask on the front of the CRT like that and that's what causing it you've got to shrink the display and all that sort of stuff well no that's uh, not the case trust me this is the proper uh, size for the screen I've used it before it is actually a rectangular front it's nothing to do with any sort of circular mask in there whatsoever um, but the reason for this is uh, very obvious but to understand it I think we should go to the whiteboard but just a quick little uh, note on why you might see this uh, screen pulsing a little bit um, the variation in the brightness well that's to do with the update of the scan update rate of this uh, ancient CRT display and my camera my camera is currently uh, shooting this at uh, 25 uh, frames per second all right I set the camera to now 1 12th of a second so 12 updates per second and you'll notice we don't get the flicker anymore but look at that you don't you get blurring in my hand as I move it around that's because well you know we're only updating that 12 times per second I can set it as low as 6 I'm using manual uh, shutter priority here and that's 1 6 of a second and you'll notice of course no more flickering of course because we get that persistence of vision update but this is really slow and this is the maximum shutter speed of 1200 times per second and look at that I mean you know it's gonna be really really quickly really an hour but uh, sorry for anyone having epileptic fits or something should have put a warning on the video anyway I just thought I'd throw that in there because that's interesting to know if you're ever shooting uh, video of any CRT displays be the television old computer you know retro computer monitors or something like that you've got to use uh, if you don't want that flicker to show up it could be it depends on the uh, rate of course you might just get lucky but uh, generally you want a camera with shutter priority mode and here we go how a CRT works and this is probably almost very familiar to most of you I'm sure but we'll just go through it now um, as you know CRT screen it's an evacuated uh, tube like this in this case it's not a round tube on the front a lot of the old oscilloscopes back in the old days yes they actually used to be round front uh, tubes on them if you've seen those real ancient uh, valve based um, crows cathode ray oscilloscopes well this one's not of course as you saw it's like a square front on it but then it tapers off into a round neck this is the neck part of the tube down in here and basically how a CRT works it's got a heater in here it's got it heats up the uh, cathode which generates electrons which are then accelerated in a beam via the high voltage anode here and that's that uh, little strange plug you see attached to the side of the CRT and it's often as you saw inside the uh, DSA it's got a protective uh, shield over the wiring that's the real high voltage stuff you know that's the 5 10 15 20 kilovolts stuff you know so you really don't want to be touching that but then that inside uh, generates the potential difference between the cathode and the anode to accelerate the electrons as a beam via this uh, and then we have a focusing coil here in this case it's an electronic uh, focusing coil it allows you to uh, adjust as it says the focus of the beam the narrowness of the beam in there and if you and if that's all you had then you would see a very bright dot right in the center of the screen on the front and of course the front of the screen inside has a phosphor uh, coating uh, this is only a mono CRT I won't of course go into color um, which is uh, different, well, it's similar. It's got uh, three different beams. Well, let's not go there. Gets a bit complicated. Let's stick with the mono one. So if that's all we had, the heater, the cathode, the anode, the high voltage potential difference, the phosphor on the front, and the even without a focusing coil, you would still get a dot on the front of the screen there. But of course, 
what we need to form a raster image like this with uh, horizontal and scan like this as you know a CRT is scanned in lines horizontal and then a vertical number of lines like that this DSA works no different whatsoever it's scanning like that um, and the way they do that is with deflection coils because this electron beam can be deflected with a magnetic field and that's all they have they have four coils all here please excuse the crudity of my uh, 3d model here I'm not very good at drawing this sort of stuff but eh. anyway it'll do basically we have wide deflection plates on the top and bottom or deflection plates deflection coils um, they're implemented as a as coils inside the unit as you'll actually see but they've got one on the top and bottom and one on the side for the X so when you uh, energize the X coils here you can make the beam sweep across the front of the CRT like that and likewise with Y you can select which line you want and of course you can turn the beam off and on very quickly so you can actually generate individual dots and then you can build up a dot matrix rastered screen like that so that's all there is to it pretty simple but what's causing the vignetting on the screen as you saw we were getting dark patches uh, dark corners on the screen like it was some circular you know like there was some circular mask on the front of the screen and what is the only circular thing inside this thing it's not the front of the screen because it's like rectangular it's the neck here the neck is circular so what we've got if these are uh, now I've got a side view of the CRT and if these are the deflection coils here the X and Y the Y is on top there and the X is on this side and the far side there now normally this uh, deflection coil is pushed right up against the neck of the CRT here so let's actually draw that as if that was the case okay if it was like that please excuse the crudity of that it's right up against the neck like that and of course this is the point where the electron beam actually bends so if we've got our electron beam coming through here like this it's at this point that it's going to bend like that and go up and hit the screen up here like this and if it's right up against the neck then there's nothing in the way to display the full screen of this thing like this but if this deflection system is moved backwards along the neck like that which will represent which we can show you right now like this let's say it's like that and it's moved back along there then what happens the beam comes through here and then it tries to bend too early and it hits some of it the outer part of it hits the corners like that and what does that turn into on the front of the screen if this is the front of the screen like this you get an image that is you know perfect in the center but then has these rounded corners on them because it is getting uh, the beam is hitting the internal edge of the uh, CRT there so you're getting these rounded corners and that's what's happening here the uh, deflection coils are too far back on the neck like that very simple there's no real other explanation for it so yesterday when I was doing the preliminary repair on the scope I did actually push that uh, forward because that's the obvious reason for it but it didn't budge so and I couldn't because it had all the shielding all over the CRT I couldn't see that it was directly up against the neck and I thought it was but obviously it's too far back on the neck I've got to use more force use a bigger hammer get a bit medieval and give this thing a bit of percussive maintenance and there's lots more advanced stuff which goes into these CRTs as well. You saw those little permanent, those four little permanent magnets sort of, you know, arranged in various locations. There's various techniques, there's various patterns on that sort of thing for actually uh, optimizing uh, the screen, the roundness of the screen and the geometry of the image and all that sort of stuff. Bit of black magic goes into that but we won't try and explain that today because we don't have the full info and yes as it turns out I just applied a bit more uh, force on this thing and I was able to move it uh, back in there so that looks like it's the issue now that 
looks pretty much that feels like it's now all the way in uh, to really see that I'd have to take the metal shield off which I don't uh, particularly want to do but uh, I believe that that really feels like it's in there now so there was just uh, something maybe stuck on the uh, side of that which uh, meant that when I pushed it forward uh, in the previous video I thought it was in but it wasn't so I'm absolutely certain that's what was causing the VIG netting that we saw on the front of the uh, CRT in there but um, we can actually uh, play around with that and experiment and uh, see that we'll get um, as we move this entire deflection assembly back and forth we'll be able to see that uh, we can change the amount of uh, VIG netting on the front of the CRT and of course we can uh, rotate this entire uh, assembly as well which uh, then gave us the rotation issue which we got before but uh, yeah basically we just want to move it back and forth on that neck and we should be able to see this and by the way yes this is all powered off and it is uh, uh, safe once it's all uh, powered off and discharged then to um, uh, go in there and sort of you know play with this assembly but you don't want to be dicking around with this when the thing's live that's for sure unless you absolutely know what you're doing anyway what we've got here is our four wires they're our deflection coil assembly one for the X one for the Y coil up in there which uh, it goes through all the bobbin I won't um, uh, I don't know I might take this uh, shield off maybe if it's uh, relatively easy but you'll notice that there was no uh, focusing coil which we saw on there there actually is but it's inside and it's coming up you can see the focus pot down here there's the focus pot and it looks like we've got the focus wires coming up down into the uh, neck board here and then they've got extra pins on there which then go through so they're going to have the uh, focus coil on the inside of the tube instead of on the outside like we uh, showed simplistically on the whiteboard and bingo as we expected once we pushed that deflection coil all the way forward right at the base of the neck ta-da there's our test pattern no problems whatsoever beauty let's see if we can make it come back I've just moved it a tad back here I think the rotation's slightly off so we might see a little bit of rotation there but let's have a go and there we go it wasn't uh, quite as far back as what it was originally and you can see it just starting to appear on the corners there because that electron beam is hitting the inside of that CRT tube there bingo fixed I'll just push that back and uh, screw that back into place and Bob's your uncle and by the way this uh, front panel mesh here as uh, several people pointed out is actually a uh, screening mesh to stop any of the uh, CRT scanning frequencies escaping from this thing and as we saw in the previous video the uh, the shielding on this system, the way they've designed the shielding is absolutely incredible. Belt and braces stuff, because this is a really, you know, a precision bit of kit down in the low frequency range. So um, the scan frequency of the CRT, you know, however many tens of kilohertz it is, um, it's going to be in that range, is smack in the middle of the DC to 100 kilohertz measurement range of this thing. So you really, you know, um, that's a really vital part of getting, uh, you know, the noise floor and the performance out of this instrument. Now you may actually be wondering, well, where is the ground connection for this uh, metal mesh screen? By the way, it's just like your uh, microwave oven, uh, for example, except that's uh, stopping you know, 2.45 gigahertz. This one's stopping low frequency stuff, but to do that, it's got to be grounded in some way, and there's no grounding connection on there, uh, really. But this, um, the uh, plastic, what you might think is a plastic front panel in here, it's not. Check it out nickel screened look at that and they've got it's all conductive so and of course this goes back to this metal tab which is connected onto the chassis and everything's just fine so they've really gone to town on the shielding of this thing but not surprising considering the precision instrument that it is it's really designed for low noise low signal level and they just can't tolerate any lack of shielding whatsoever so of course they just went completely belt and braces on the thing nickel screened all the plastic in the front the shielding on the CRT which keeps it out all the you know triple screening in here all of the design of the chassis this 
ridiculous you know like it just even the front the gold on the front um, plate there and the uh, shielding huge shielding box on the uh, input and uh, source terminals then they've got the uh, shielding inside these individual cans and then they'd be shielded again and they're probably using um, uh, screened read relays in there for the switching and oh goodness Woo! talking about gilding the lily but that's what you get in a high performance, high price instrument like this. And can we actually measure that noise? Oh, you bet we can. All you need is a scope probe, put it up to the front there, and uh, just the pickup on the uh, probe is enough to get the noise there. And if you take that off, you don't get nearly as much because you've got some extended metal in there um, to, acting as an antenna. But there you go. That's a rather effective antenna. We've got the uh, vertical uh, rate here, 56.1 hertz. There it is. So that's our vertical scan. And then if we zoom in on the scope, you'll notice this uh, higher frequency stuff. And that there is about four divisions there. And uh, we're 10 microseconds per division, 40 microseconds. That's 25 kilohertz. That's the horizontal scan rate. So there you go. We can easily pick up that and in a you know, high precision measurement environment which these DSAs are specifically designed for that sort of noise can really kill you and of course we can make that go away with the magic screen inside here so here's our probe there it is it's picking all and picking up all that junk if you put this in front of it and the tabs on there are connecting through to the metal case on the back which is actually uh, screened as you can see very well, it's probably there, but it's probably going to be very low. It's going to be very effective. Look at that. Ah, yeah, I can't even get that. That's just other crap in the air. Bloody ripper. What a Bobby Dazzler, this one. Really like it. Hope you like the video. Catch you next time.